<clears throat> All right, let me take a look. All right, they're filtering in, but we'll start in a few seconds after we sort of level out. We had like almost 200 people sign up for this. Excellent. Mm -hmm. The Workforce Commission was so great today too. Really good. You really know? Good. They were just, just, they were just adorable. <laughs> Sitting there just, in their little office. Oh my gosh. They're, they're not only great people, but they're really trying to help our, our, our um, owners, right? And at the same time, balancing, we need to do the right thing for employees always. And so it's, yeah, I don't know, it's heartwarming to know that we have answers. Yeah, right, exactly. We don't have to just keep waiting. Cool. Well, it looks like we've sort of leveled out with a number of attendees. So thank Perfect. you guys so much for being here tonight. Um, we're still toying around with the name of these as we go forward. Um, but I think Night Talk is really fun. So <laughs> I'll leave it for um, Emily Williams Knight, our president and CEO, to walk us through the latest CARES Act edition. Excellent. Good. Hi, guys. Good evening. Um, hope everyone had a good day. We're, we're back again. Um, I'm going to actually just take a little bit of a step back because phase two, which um, goes into effect on April 1st, which is the kind of the first thing that came at, down the pike, which was the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, also now known as FF, FFCRA. Um, there's been a number of questions, and I'm first going to let all of you know, as you were busy today running your restaurants, um, we had an excellent webinar with the Texas Workforce Commission. They very, um, they came to us and said, we'd love to do something just for your members to be able to walk through what does this mean to them? And so we're posting in our website, it was an hour of probably 70 questions that were answered by their attorneys and the head of the Workforce Commission himself. So for all of our employers, um, I can tell you, I learned a tremendous amount on that call and I think it'll be really helpful. So go to the TRA website, We'll also put it out tonight in our nightly note, but I think, and Anna put it here for all of you. So, so that's first. Most importantly, a um, couple of big updates on this to make sure we have clarity. First and foremost is around the chargeback. If you have someone who goes on to unemployment and is let go for a clear COVID, so for example, you have shut your restaurant down, your sales have gone to less than 50%. All of those would qualify you to not receive a charge back as an employer who's had to let those people go. So that's number one. The next one is around tips and tipped employees. If you have been reporting the tipped wage to the full wage through the system, you can actually, that is actually what will be calculated as um, that employee's wage or essentially what they earned if it was counted in the system. So tips and tipped employees wages are reported together if that's how you were doing it for those employees. The next part is, is that the 500 unit threshold therefore must provide paid sick leave or expanded or medical leave. And so if you think about that, I've had people call me and say, well, what if I have 501 and that's the total count, then this would not apply to you. So it's really that 500 and under that this will apply to. When you're looking at your employees, and this is really important because many of our employees are coming to their companies saying, this is awful, I don't like it, I can see why, but what's gonna help me? And we're gonna talk about phase three in a second, but on phase two, there are sort of two things, which is the waiting period of one week has been waived for your employees that may have to go on unemployment. And the second is they're gonna waive the looking for work. And that's really because many of our places around Texas are in a shelter in place. So asking an employee to go out to stand on employment benefits, to go out to find a job really doesn't seem very fair. So that has also been put into this. You, if you are a business and you have less than 500 employees on April 1st, this particular act will go into effect. And so um, we are, that's next week. And so as you think about, um, you know, your own businesses and where you may sit today, just understand that the paid sick leave, there's sort of two, two defining moments, paid sick leave, which is paid leave under the Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act and expandy, expanded family medical leave. And there's lots of examples on our website about who would go under that category. Caring for someone that has a COVID related illness, daycare and childcare um, for someone that has that COVID related illness, there are lots of categories in there, so make sure that you take the time to look through that to make sure you're compliant on April 1st. Um, I think that was all the big questions we had from, from that. Oh, and yes, and one more. For employers, as you're um, 
employees begin to file unemployment, if you've had to separate with them, you will have to respond to each one of those, um, I guess, claim returns as it comes back. You need to actually make sure that you respond to each one and you respond to it in a timely manner. And if it's COVID related, the reason for separation must be COVID-19. And that way the charge back as it's fully today will not apply to you. So make sure the reasoning is very clear. If it's just a normal layoff, clearly you will not qualify for the one-to-one -one tax credit with less than 500, but you also wanna make sure you put the reason down and that you can demonstrate that that is indeed the reason that you've had to separate with that employee. Go ahead, Anna. Yeah, I had a, an interesting conversation today with one of our members who asked, um, should, so apparently there's a requirement for him to post the parameters of the Families First Coronavirus Relief Act um, in his restaurant on April 1st. And he said that there's some sort of fine print that says they won't be fined if they don't put it up for like the first month. And so he said, should I even hang up the thing? I don't know if I want people to know everything in here. And I said, you should hang it up. It's yeah. definitely worth people being knowledgeable about it, talk to your employees about it so that they know what's available as well, but they definitely need to hang it up in their restaurant. Yep, and we'll make sure we have a copy of that on our website as well, just to make it easy for everyone to be able to, um, to download, print off, and hang up. So that was phase two, and now we're looking in the face of phase three. And um, phase three is called the CARES Act. And I think you all know it stands for the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act. It was passed by the Senate this morning. It will go in front of the House tomorrow. They are scheduled to meet at 9 a.m. Um, because we have this social distancing and a number of members that um, are ill, um, they will try to do first a voice vote, which is people can stand and yell for and against or yay and nay. Um, I think it kind of is the loud voice wins. If we are in agreement, and I think by Pelosi kind of going down this path yesterday, we, sit, we tend to believe that while, while it may not be unanimous, that we should be able to get something done with a voice vote. If someone calls for a recorded vote, then we're going to have to wait longer because that's a whole different animal and they're going to likely put 30 members of Congress in at a time separated to actually do this vote. If things go well in the House tomorrow, we expect the president could potentially sign this act before the day is over. And so then Congre uh, Congress will essentially recess. I don't know where they will be, but they really won't begin a phase four until likely the end of April or early May. And so this is kind of the big one right now. And I believe that we have to think about what we have in this for us and then what's gonna come next, which is the next one will be a much bigger fight um, because that's when you're gonna get into lots of things that both parties want in a bill. So this one is pretty much baked. Now I'm gonna ask for a really important caveat. We, ugh, I'm trying to think, we got this at what, eight o'clock in the last night? 1,400, 1,500 pages, whatever it was, and then we had to start summarizing it. The really important caveat to you is if you need very specific technical information, you need to make sure you're talking to an attorney. You also need to make sure that we've had time to digest this because it's not even been passed by the House, it's not been signed by the President, and while we don't expect a lot of changes, you will see me in here indicate that today, we're not sure how this is interpreted. Ourselves, our National Restaurant Associate colleagues, our colleagues across the hotel association, you name it. There are still some things I'm gonna to explain today that are not 100% clear in how we interpret it. But as that comes out, just as I've done, you know, since this started, we will get that in your hands as quick as we can. So let's start with this, this first part of it, which is the Paycheck Protection Program. And that just called the PPP. And um, really what that is, is it's a new relief channel that has been separated from the Small Business Administration to administer these funds and these programs. So the way it works is it's 349 billion in cash flow assistance through 100% federally guaranteed loans to small businesses and 501c3s. So that's sort of the audience they're gonna, they're, 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 they're looking at. The really key part of this is that they have two goals in this, to bring back workers that you may have already had to lay off February 15th until today or going forward, and they wanna to try to keep people employed, right? So many of you have already had to lay off, but at the same time, you probably wanna bring those great people back. And that this was designed to help you recover employees as well as keep those that you have on the books. 
So we're going to walk through what this um, program will cover, and I think this is going to be good news for a lot of you, which is the loans covered period is February 15th. So as long as you were in business on February 15th, you will qualify for this. If you've stood up a business um, I mean, before February 15th, if you stood up a business two weeks ago, two days ago, that would not apply to you. So you had to be operational on February 15th. I think that answers one of the questions that just came in. Um, and until June 30th of 2020. The forgiveness amount of what you can use this for, meaning that you can collect, and we'll talk about how much money you can collect in a loan, there is a, a, a portion of this that will be forgiven. And the easiest way to describe it is you don't have to pay it back. And those are the funds that you would use towards payroll costs, payments on interest on mortgage obligations, rent obligations, and utility payments. Now, separately to this, we've been, we saw that there was a consumer waiver on utilities for a period of time. And so you'll see a piece today where I joined to say we wanted utility relief for small business as well in particular for our restaurant industry. So in, in the meantime, you will be able to use some of these loan dollars to cover utility, rent obligation, mortgage and interest, and payroll costs, okay? So the way it, it, this works, I'm gonna lay it out for you. The sum of payments of any compensation with respect to employees that is a salary or a wage. Payment of cash tip or equivalent, that was something that came up today. Payment for vacation, parental, family, medical, or sick leave. Allowance for dismissal or separation. Payment required for the provisions of group health care benefits, including insurance premiums. Payment of any retirement benefit or payment of any state or local assessed or compensation of employees. So if you think about that bucket and you go down, you think to yourself right away, how much, what can I borrow, right? What can I take? What can I write off? What's unforgiven? This is, this is an interesting equation, and we're gonna post this for y'all after, because I know it's a lot. Um, the maximum loan amount that you will be able to take is the lesser of the next two things I'm gonna walk you through. Either $10 million, okay, or two and a half times your monthly payroll from the previous year. Okay, so what they're trying to do is to make sure that you don't all of a sudden bring back a bunch of people, overinflate your payroll, take out a big loan, and then lay a bunch of people off. I think it's kind of the way the mechanism is supposed to work. This is one of the big questions that we're trying to uncover. Is it 10 million per unit, right? So let's say you own 10 Taco Bells and you have um, none of them have more than 500 employees in each. Some people are saying it's 10 million per unit that you can borrow up to. Others are saying it's the business entity, so the franchisee, right? Or, so let's say I own 10 of them. You would be able to get up to 10 million or the calculation of your monthly payroll. Where we're concerned is that another organization, association is saying it's per unit. My opinion, and we'll hear from the lawyers tomorrow, is it could not possibly be. Because if you own 2,000 restaurants and got 10 million each in loans, the 349 would be gone before tomorrow if everyone did that across the nation. I think the idea was to not penalize our mid-tier independents or franchisees by making the 500, but really they're not going to give you up to $10 million per each of your units. However, this is one of those things that there is no clarity, even from our own senators yet, on what this means. So that's one I'm gonna just leave, but those are kind of the two earmarks for how much you can expect that you could borrow. And then you go down to who is eligible. And this is, this is really important. We argued with the Hotel Association to have a carve out of this piece of legislation, this act, to make sure that when you have multiple units, you would still qualify. So I'm going to read this to you because in this, the only organizations or industries that were carved out, only small businesses that employ less than 500 people are eligible for the Paycheck Protection Program and SBA loan forgiveness. However, carve out restaurants, food service caterers, and hotels that employ not more than 500 employees per physical location of the business are eligible to receive a single loan. That's gonna help so many of you that thought you were just capped out of this because if you added your employees together, you would not qualify. 
it's actually going to be looked at per unit. And so that's really, really important. The program was enacted by this legislation would also remove now the credit to elsewhere test. This is super, super important. And this is another thing that was really important to us, which was some of you that went after the economic injury money found out that you could essentially the credit elsewhere test would apply. And if you had a great line of credit, you would be told no, right? Up to $2 million in loans. This, the uh, credit elsewhere test, which essentially is a mathematical test that assumes and does a pretty in-depth and frankly lengthy in time, which is why I also think we got it removed, calculation that if you could borrow money from somewhere else, then you wouldn't qualify. That has been removed. That's actually really, really great. Also, another huge win, and I know this because I have so many small businesses I'm on the phone with right now, no collateral or personal guarantee will be required for you to get this loan. I don't know about you in the market right now with what we're looking at, I wouldn't be willing to put up a personal guarantee or anything else. And so that has also been removed. So that's really, really important. So then we're gonna go into um, what is loan forgiveness, okay? So loan forgiveness is what you care the most about. And then we'll talk about what you can't get forgiven and what the estimated interest rate and repayment will be. But right now, the loan forgiveness is um, the borrower, borrower is eligible for, for loan forgiveness equal to the amount spent by the borrower during an eight-week period after the origination date of the loan regarding payroll costs, interest payment on any mortgage, accrued prior to February 15, 2020, payment of rent on any lease in force prior to February 15, 2020, and payment on any utility for which service began prior to February 15th. Again, they're trying to set up a mechanism that on March 1st, if you opened as the COVID was starting to, you know, become more of a crisis, we would call it, that the date they set was February 15th. So if you were in business and your lights were turned on, you were paying utilities, you had a mortgage or rent, and you had employees before the 15th of February, you were in good shape, okay? They will look at the eight weeks after the loan originates and all those pieces will be forgiven when they do the calculation of what those costs are. So the way you wanna think about it is most of you on this call or video call um, are going to be able to write off essentially, and I call it write off, meaning not have to repay the money you borrow in those categories as long as you were operating before the 15th. And there'll be a nice calculation of how this works. Forgiveness on a covered loan is equal to the sum of the following payroll costs incurred during the covered eight week period compared to the previous year or time period. So essentially think about it this way, they're going to look back at the same time period last year. One of the key parts about this is if you rehire people, right? So let's say you rehired people that you furloughed two weeks ago because now you're gonna have some of the loan money to pay for it, that will not count against you compared to last year. So they're not going to penalize you if you've furloughed or terminated and you bring them back, that will not impact your loan amount calculation in any kind of negative way. To encourage employers to rehire any employee who has already been laid off due to COVID-19, borrowers that, borrowers that rehire workers previous laid off will not be penalized for having a reduced payroll at the beginning of the period. And I think for so many of you, a lot of the questions we've been getting is, how do I get my employees back? We know that right now there are other industries that are gonna hire our people, grocery, Amazon, you name it. If, if our employees are very talented and frankly trained employees decide not to return to us, we already had a massive labor crisis. This labor crisis is going to be 10 times worse. So if you can get a loan in place and know that you don't have to pay back the portion to bring some of your employees back that were your best employees, I know how much you're hurting about them not being here, this is what the mechanism that will do it. And if you do do that, it will not count against you. Um, any loan amounts not forgiven. So let's talk about the stuff like food, like things that are not part of this that you need to use in order to get your business actually restarted. Maybe it's been closed. Maybe it's just working, you know, you're working maybe just the curbside drive through issue. Any loan amount not forgiven at the end of one year is carried forward as an ongoing loan with terms of a max of 10 years and a max of 4% interest. So let's say you're back on your feet, we've surpassed a year, 
much of your loan has been forgiven, but you still have $100,000. You have up to 10 years and no more than 4% interest to get that loan paid off. For many of our small restaurants, that's significant. They will not be able to pay that kind of debt off as we're still also rebuilding the economy. So that's a pretty long window and the 100% loan guarantee will remain intact. The calculation for an average monthly number of full-time equivalent employees is going to be averaged at 30 hours per week, which is exactly what we use for the um, Affordable Care Act. So that would be the equivalent of the hours. Loan forgiveness may also cover additional wages paid by businesses to tipped employees, and you'd fo follow that under the Fair, Stabor, uh, Fair Labor Standards Act. So that also would cover your tipped employees, and we'll talk about that on unemployment in a second. So on the loan mechanics, the program is administered through the SBA 7A loan program. <laughs> John, I know you're fried. I, I'm sorry, guys. I see John Moore just pull up. He's like, I'm fried. I promise you that we are going to put this online and you'll be able to read even more. But right now you get to hear my voice walking you through it. Um, so the, and the government guarantee increases to 100% through December 31st and then reduces 75% for loans exceeding 150 85% for loans equal or two less of 150. So, um, so that, and actually I see a question too, which is how do we apply for this? And we'll talk about it at the end too, because you, you know, your bank should be in this discussion um, in some regards, but also you'll be able to go right to the SBA loan site and apply for this as well. Um, waivers, uh, waives both borrower and lender fees for 7A loans. So normally there's some hefty fees and those have actually also been um, waived as well. So let's talk about one of the big wins that was hidden in here. Um, I have to tell you, when I saw this, all this stuff is great, but also QUIP has been settled. So if you know what QUIP is, which is Qualified Improvement Property, the team and I were just in DC with a number of our board members fighting about this. It was essentially a drafting error that has been carried over, which made people essentially amortize over 39 years. It was brutal. That has been fixed and immediately businesses will be able to write off costs associated with the improving facilities. Instead of going 39 years, we go back to exactly what it was before. This may be for some of you something you're un, maybe not as familiar with, but I can tell you from a lot of um, folks that have been trying to open new units, trying to rehab units, brutal. So we were finally, unfortunately, it took a crisis, but we were finally able to get this over the line. Um, the next piece is community, and some of these are not going to be directly impacted to restaurants, but I think they're important parts of that would probably touch you as a small business owner. So we're going to go through these two. Um, community development block grants. And so two billion has been allocated for state and local governments based on prevalence of risk of COVID-19. I think you know there's eight states now that have been inclu included um, as a kind of emergency disaster areas. Texas being one of them, that'll open up more funding. But as we recover and receive money in our business, we also need to make sure that our states have the funds to take care of this crisis clearly that's growing and the healthcare implications are significant. Um, this is another one for all the financial people on the phone. Modifications for net operating losses. So the new provision relaxes the limitations on a company's use of losses from prior years. So currently, they're subject to taxable income limitations and cannot be carried back to reduce income in a prior tax year. This new provision that was added actually provides that a loss from 18, 19, or 20 can now be carried back over five years. So that's awesome. Um, next thing is delay of payment of employer payroll taxes. This one has been coming up a ton. Employers can defer payment of employer share of their social security tax. The deferred employment tax to be paid over the following two years with half of the amount required by December of 2021 and the other half of December 31st of 2022. And what you can see throughout this, as well as some of the things that are coming down the state, is, is we want to get money, and we'll talk about each of you as individuals in this, get money in people's hands, get money into restaurants, which is what we care the most about across the whole U.S., I guess, and get that moving. And then for a lot of the loans or taxes or things that are due is to just extend the window for all of you, right? No one has said we're not going to pay taxes, especially sales tax and money we collected. But at the same time, we just don't want to do it right now, right? We're, we're very 
uh, liquidity wise, we're not a, a, a high liquid business and we're a narrow margin business in industry. So some of this stuff by kicking it down doesn't make it go away. It just gives you time to get your feet under you and to have the loans come in and bring people back and get them working so they can feed their own families. And then we're actually in a much better place in you know, six months to 12 months, which is the optimistic Emily. Um, the other thing I wanna talk about is sort of two things for employees. Um, one of the things we can never lose sight of is how our employees are faring right now. Um, everyone is having to make really tough decisions. So restaurant employees and other workers who qualify for unemployment insurance after being laid off for a COVID-19 uh, event will get an additional 600 per week for four months. So for some of you that are very concerned about your employees, that could be incredibly helpful. I will tell you, some of you saw in the last 48 hours, some of our um, senators were concerned about this because depending on what your salary was prior to being laid off, if the 521 is the maximum amount you can earn in unemployment per week in Texas, if you did 521 plus 600 per week, now you're making $1,100 a week and you're unemployed. And so there was a lot of pushback from individuals that that was either too hefty or frankly would incentivize people not to work. You know, in my own opinion, non-political is that if we can give families right now and individual workers that have lost their jobs an extra 600 a week, that is the right thing to do. And if we're a great company to work for, those employees are going to come back. Because, you know, I'm sorry, but four months is not a long period of time. But those employees that have had to be let go because we can't operate our business due to a mandated government closure of our dining rooms, let's bring them back. But no, in the meantime, until you can, they're gonna get essentially an extra $1,600 a month on top of their unemployment. And so that should make you at least feel slightly better about having to make some tough decisions. Also, the final number, and you saw this move all over the place, but the bill calls for direct payments of $1,200 to employees or citizens earning less than 75,000. So anyone who's earned less than $75,000 will get a check for $1,200 as a U.S. citizen. Someone asked me today, does it go up to people that make three, four, five hundred dollars $500,000? No. It actually gets to $75,000. And then after $75,000, they take off $5 less for every hundred exceeding seventy five. dollars So essentially, once you get to someone, a manager or someone who makes $99,000, they will not be receiving a check. So that's sort of how this, I guess, finally landed um, the plane here. So um, for employers, deferred payroll taxes, restaurants and other businesses that have continued to pay employees during the COVID-19 crisis will be refunded the payroll taxes paid on 50% of the wages. So if you've been able to maintain some of your employees through this crisis, when they do the look back, you will be able to be refunded up to 50% of those tax, 50% of the wages, the tax element of that. So again, sort of just another, another opportunity to save money wherever you can. Eligibility is limited to enterprises that have been forced to close or have suffered at least a 50% drop in revenues from one year ago. Many of you are on with me on Facebook. You saw my post this morning. We've already lost 25 billion in revenue as of yesterday across this country and 3 million jobs. I don't know a restaurant. I have a couple, frankly, there's a couple that have reached out and said, hey, I'm doing great because I'm shipping a lot of alcohol out the front door that's prepackaged and my drive throughs going crazy, right? There are some people that are doing A-okay. I would argue the majority are not. And so this actually, most of you would then qualify for deferred payroll taxes. So then we get into um, another part of this plan, which is I call kind of the assistant that it's for big business. It's about 500 billion. The biggest recipient of this, uh, I guess maybe one sector is the airlines. So the airlines, of course, because in many cases like us, they have had government mandates to either not fly to certain countries or due to shelter in place, their customer base is not able to actually participate in you know, buying their product. So that's a big chunk of this. The other is that the remaining 454 billion will be used to stabilize the government, the private sector parties that have been wounded by the pandemic, look at us, eligible companies are prohibited from using the funds for stock buybacks and cutting their current workforce before September 30th. This was one of the few things I saw that everyone agreed on, including the president, both sides. 
And that's because after the last debacle on, if you remember, we have shovel ready projects. I can remember, I don't remember when, how old I was when that happened, but the bottom line was there was no projects and the money was hard to track. So this actually puts it in that um, if your stock has been absolutely depleted, there is no aggressive stock buyback to make a bunch of millionaires right now until we get through the crisis. And in the same regard, if they take, anyone takes money out of this particular element, you cannot lay off your workforce. 10% um, cut back before September 30th. And I think that's actually really good for, for people. So finally, um, the tax filing deadline, as you know, federally has been extended from April 15th to July 15th. Um, I've been asked if we're going to do that in Texas. We're actually one of the few states that has not moved our deadline. I was in um, some texting discussions with our comptroller who I like very much and I'm so glad that I'm not in that job. Um, because with oil and gas and restaurants being the second highest producing sales tax, that's a big hole to fill. Um, he wants to do the right thing for us. He, he knows that we need help. And I think you saw that he came out publicly and said, we will work with you. I will tell you that in any type of taxes from a state perspective, I encourage you, whatever is due to file. Do not pay at that moment. Pick up the phone, call the number we continue to publish, and we have been told numbers of times people are getting extensions, people are getting no interest, no penalty, no fees. So this is a time when you call and explain your situation, and the comptroller is absolutely, he and his team are working with us. I cannot tell you if they're gonna push the deadline. I don't know. I think that they're trying to assess how big the hole is. And I think I explained before that in Texas, to defer one industry, you have to defer all. And that's the jurisdiction of the comptroller. He cannot simply pick an industry and change either the reporting, the timing, and what is expected in a blanket case. However, we know the legislature could. So that's why you see all the noise starting to pick up about a special session. I will say from the comptroller's office to the Texas Workforce Commission, to TABC, and I'll close with this one update because I know I get a lot of questions about it and then we'll go back to answering all the questions on the CARES Act. Alcohol that has been sealed at the restaurant, non-manufactured, okay? If I ever knew in my career, I'd spend so much time talking about alcohol, I, I wouldn't have believed it. The bottom line is we are not gonna get approval to be able to have people pull up their car to a restaurant, get a cup, a solo cup or 375, of a margarita and get back in their car and drive away. Um, if I was the governor, I'd have huge concern, especially with the kind of environment we've been directed to be in now with no movement. Um, I have pushed as hard as I possibly could. We are still at the table to ask if we can get delivery, right? So sealed there by put your margarita in the cup, seal it there and take it with you. And so there could be some life in this, but I just always will be honest. And at some point, my job is to know when I push too hard and we lose the voice. And right now we are at the center of a lot of these discussions and TRA is leading it. And what I don't wanna do is I have, you have to trust my judgment that when no is now no, we need to look at what else is coming down the pike and all the relief that we're gonna need from the state, we're gonna need to make sure that we are at the table and thoughtful and again, sometimes no is no. So sell as much as you can prepackaged. I'm working very hard on delivery. We've got a number of people. TABC has been an amazing partner, but on the curbside container slap with a lid of alcohol, I, it's just not gonna happen. Um, and you have to, yes, I know, Tracy, I know lots of people are doing lots of things they should not. Um, we, TABC has been extraordinarily patient and we know that nobody wants a health inspector, a regulator, anyone else walking in, but it's not taking long on social media for the folks that are really being pretty, they're gonna hurt it for everybody. And I can tell you that TABC can, can be in their desks and try to be great citizens for us right now and manage that way. But if we continue to see some of the behavior, which frankly is, is really dangerous in some cases, um, then, that, that, then there are gonna have to have more enforcement, period. Um, so you can absolutely sell prepackaged kits. Yeah, and that's what people are doing. They're selling the bottles that are prepackaged. It makes the margarita and they're selling an awful lot of them. Um, but, but the idea of the open container piece, um, you know, please just hear me on this and know that it's hours a day on this alcohol issue. So um, I'll leave that at that. And then we will open it for any questions that you all have. And then I will take this 
which is then <laughs> heavily edited and we will put it up online for you and maybe and we'll just dump it into some slides so they can just quickly see each part sure sure we can do that so one question and and i have to caveat this before we jump into questions and and just sort of reiterate what emily said earlier that this bill is not signed into law yet it has been passed by one group uh, there's still maybe some edits. We don't know for sure what the final bill is going to be. So if you do have questions um, and you need to follow up with an employment attorney, let us know. If you're a TRA member, you have access to the TRA Law Center, which means you get access to um, phone calls and conversations with our lawyer partners, and they can definitely help you out. So this first question um, is from Matt, and he's, he's confused. So he's clearly already laid off his staff. And he wants to know, should he rehire his employees, even though his restaurant isn't running the way it was before and they're not able to do drive through, should he rehire them so that they can sit and use the CARE Act's benefits to take care of his business and his employees? No, because if you don't have anything for them to do, they, you know, and again, I would, um, Matt, I'd call the Texas Workforce Commission to be certain. Um, I'm clearly not an employment attorney. But um, if your employee was laid off and you do not have work for them to do, for you to bring them back to then file for a loan to pay for them to sit, I, th I think you would have to do the math with them. And, and, and you know again, I would do the math of them being on unemployment with an extra 600 now coming in as part of this program to maybe even have them be okay while you rebuild and get to the place where you can actually open and function and have that communication with those employees to know that the minute you get the green light, they're going to come back. Um, you know, the, the money will get a better sense probably Saturday, Sunday of how quickly you can apply and how quickly the money will be turned uh, back to you. One, one um, note on that is that they are using the Department of the Treasury. So you'll apply through SBA, the Department of Treasury will be notified and they'll push your funds, your loan funds essentially through any FDIC bank. So that's going to be how the money is going to come down to you. And that's why I said earlier, it makes sense to just have your bank in these conversations. Mm -hmm. um, but that's the mechanism. So, you know, I, I would I would do the math of your employees. I would have real conversations with them. But I think it's hard to bring people back when right now we don't know when we're going to be reopened. We don't know what business will be like when we reopen if you are currently closed. Um, and I think you would want to have a plan in place to make sure you had real stable employment first because what you wouldn't want to do is bring them, you could park them and just sit there, use your loan to pay for them for the number of weeks you're allowed to, but, but I don't think that would be my advice. I would probably just do the math and I'd reach out to the Workforce Commission and say, listen, this is where I'm at. I love my employees. I want to get them back. I don't really have anything for them to do. What would you recommend? And I'm assuming they're going to say, have them continue. Now, I will tell you there is a caveat and I'm going to try to find it to this, which is, you can actually put them on a shared work plan. This is something I learned a lot about in the last 48 hours. A shared work plan is where they would come back and they would work a certain number of hours for you. So let's say they could only work 20 hours a week, right, for you. They could still then apply for unemployment benefits because they're not back with you full time, Matt. So that's one thing to talk to them about is, is there a shared work plan or can they come back and only work limited hours would you still be able to qualify those hours, right, for your special new loan coming? And then I do know they would still be able to draw unemployment at a different rate if they were working for you with reduced hours. So that, as I think through it, that may be the way I would go, is if you wanna get them back, put them on a shorter hours, let them stay on unemployment at a, a lower rate, because now you're supplementing, and then you would have those wages to be able to use from your small business loan. So I'm going to go back up to um, the original, the plan, or the chapter two in the plan. Um, mm -hmm. And someone asked, and I, I think I know the answer to this, but if they only have 20 employees, does the emergency paid sick leave apply to me? I thought it was yeah. 50 and 500 was the threshold. Is that right? Yes. And I think, you know what, if you go to the next one, I will find it because sure. I do think the final number was lower than 50. Okay, so Jeffrey also asked, and I know the answer to this one for you, Jeffrey, uh, the differences between IDLE and CARES when it comes to SBA loans. Um, should you apply for both? Does one apply and negate the other? You should definitely apply for both if you qualify for both. Um, apply for IDLE now because it's open and SBA is responding to those applications right now. 
Um, and no, applying for one does not necessarily negate the other. We had, and Jeffrey, I think you were on that SBA um, webinar that we did on Tuesday, actually, and I'll post it here for everyone to take a look at. Um, but he gave some really good information about, you know, what happens if you apply for both and does it negate the other? And, and I believe he said it, it doesn't. Um, the difference, of course, between IDLE and CARES is how much you can borrow. Um, and we have the information on that too. Did you find their answer, Emily? I did. So, so I'll, I'll read you, I'll read you an example we spent, we sent to DOL, but I think it would, Department of Labor, I think it would also be the same. The NRA team had sent this, this on. If providing childcare related paid sick leave and expanded family leave medical, my business with fewer than 50 employees would jeopardize the viability of my business as a going concern. It says to elect the small business exemption, you should document why your business with 50 or fewer employees meets the criteria set forth by the department, which will be addressed in more detail in forthcoming regulations. So it sounds like if you're able to demonstrate an ongoing concern that by a business with 50 or less will inhibit your ability to be successful as a business, you would not have to go under this act. So, and but you see the last line here from the Department of Labor addressed in more detail and forthcoming regulations. So, um, I thought it was 20. It looks like it did land on 50. So if you can today demonstrate that if you had a bunch of employees go out on paid sick leave, that your business would be unable to, you know, essentially have an ongoing concern, then you'd be able to say, I need an exemption from this act. Cool. Um, I'll give you an easy one. Um, what's the difference between laid off and furloughed when it comes to the CARES Act? Not much at all. They're yeah. almost interchangeable. So, um, got a piece of paper somewhere from today's call, um, but, but there's really not much difference at all. Um, one of the questions today was if you furloughed something, it was more around benefits. I think furlough is the assumption that you will rehire. So furlough, for example, um, Tillman Fertitta, I think yesterday furloughed 40,000 people. The idea of furlough is that you can, in some cases, still pay them a portion, but more importantly, your intent is to bring them back. And so if you think about the, um, uh, uh, first one, phase two. If you think about phase two, which is family first, on April 1st, any of the employees, if you are in the window that would have to be part of this act, you'd be required to do uh, paid sick leave and expanded family medical leave. If you separate with an employee before that date, because you've already had the business impact, they would be not eligible for any of those elements. If they, if you rehire an employee that you separated with, they would eventually, obviously, then be eligible once again. Um, when we met with the Workforce Commission today, they used the words furlough and um, uh, 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 furloughed and terminated or separated almost interchangeably. Where I would check this is that on the um, uh, Family First Act, which is the one that contains this paid sick leave and um, expanded family medical leave. Just check that with an employment attorney or your legal counsel that if they were furloughed with the intent to come back, how would that act apply to them between the time you let them go and the time they returned, right? So I think that's the big question. Um, I don't want to give you the wrong answer, and I'm sure it's somewhere I'm looking at my desk covered in paper, but I would simply just send a quick note to the Texas Workforce Commission. And, and I think what might be helpful is we capture all your questions it's almost e easier for the agencies, like we had TABC the other day. We can put all these, Anna, in. We'll an take off the ones we've already answered, but all of these, we're, we just need clarity. And then tomorrow, we can post these back for all of you, just as reference. And I think much to make it easier than doing one by one with, with them, or you know, we can maybe take the lead on getting the answers. Yeah, we can do that. There is, there is one thing that's come up a few times, though, here in the Q&A window that I, I think you should address um, related to how restaurants are handling rent. And I know this has come up multiple times, you know, over the past 12 days or whenever. I think the Cheesecake Factory just told us what they're doing, right? They did. They are not going to pay it. And, um, you know, there's been a lot of conversation around that. What are your thoughts? Yeah, so I have a couple of thoughts. One, I think, you, you know, you need to have a conversation and ask for relief. You don't need to tell them you're not going to pay. I think that you need to have the conversation, which is, um, my business has been, most of my revenue generating has been shut down due to COVID-19. And, um, and because of that, I'm unable to pay my rent. What can you do for me? Or I think I'm going to be unable to pay my rent and look for relief. We definitely have examples of landlords on the rental side, giving people 30 days, 60 days, et cetera. 
this is where the new piece, this new act is so critical for you all because you can use, once you get your loan money, you can use it to pay for rent and not have to pay it back. Mm -hmm. So some would argue, and again, this is a legal choice. I wanna be really clear, please don't, you know, not pay until the landlord, Emily said I didn't have to. If you are where you have the next month where you can stay open, knowing that you now can apply the minute this is signed in to law, you can apply. I would say you ask your landlord, can I please have 30 days, 45 days without penalty? I want to be here. I want to keep my restaurant. I mean, if you're the landlord, you're kind of crazy not to do something helpful because who do you think you're going to have moving in there in the next six months? I mean, hate to say it. So if that's the case, then you have time for this loan to come into place. Then you have time to pay your rent and you know you don't have to pay that money back. So I, I, I would really just try to have a thoughtful conversation first, ask for a deferment for at least 30 to 60 days, and then with no penalty and no interest, apply for your loan, make sure you know you qualify. Lot, lots of people qualify. This is really the, the carve out for the restaurants and hotels was just a huge win. And so, then you can actually take those funds that you get in, pay your rent. You're, you're going you're gonna to be behind if they don't give you relief, right? Abatement. But in the meantime, I would just ask for a deferment without penalties and fees until you can get this in, in the bank. Okay. So um, on that, we do have other questions that are lingering, but to be honest, um, I think it's best that we just wait and put that in front of TWC. They've told us that we can send them over questions and hopefully get them answered in the next few days. I know they're slammed. Um, you know, we are recording this. I know a lot of people have asked. We will put this up on the website probably in the next hour, I guess. Um, so you can revisit it. Um, and I'm sure we're going to do another one after the bill is passed, right? What, are we thinking tomorrow? Yeah, maybe tomorrow. And if not, since Saturday, well, since none of us, I mean, we're all either you're all trying to run your businesses in whatever way you can, or um, we, we will do it as soon as we have new information to share. How's that? Um, and we're also going to bring one of our law center partners with us next time. Um, so we can actually address at that point, I think we'll be ready for more of the technical questions. Um, I will share with you, there are sort of there's one other big thing we're working on right now that may may be helpful to some of you. But the SNAP ENT program, we've been working with Health and Human Services here at the state and now at DC. And um, we really believe that our fast food and quick serve partners can be set up to accept the debit card. Um, we, as you know, did a lot of work and, 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 and I think it was great. Um, Governor Abbott got a pretty big national nod for, for the work we did on retail. And we've seen unbelievable examples of restaurants is for a short period of time turning into uh, retail outlets just to survive. The next step would be to have our retail outlets, especially our quick serve, be able to take the debit card because what we're finding is in many of our low income areas in particular, the access at the grocery stores is, is just, you know, you get one trip a day and you can't get what you need. Well, now you can go to hopefully a restaurant <clears throat> that moves into this retail program for a short period of time. We don't want to get into the retail business forever, but they can also use their debit card. So their SNAP benefit card, and that's really going to help a lot of families. And so we believe we're almost there. Um, it won't be for everybody, you know, it won't be for our fine dining, but not only is it probably good to keep restaurants moving because you'll have more customers that can come to you, but it's also just really the right thing to do for, for the community right now who, you know, may be desperate to find the food they need. So that's um, a, another pretty big thing on our plate right now that we're, we're trying to get over the line. Yeah, great. Well, I think, unless you want to take one more, you want to do one Anyone more? Anyone have it? Yeah, I mean, we have like 10 minutes unless okay. anybody wants to go to bed. <laughs> no, never. Um, this is a good one from Greg, uh, Greg Van Herner from Houston. Um, he says, hey guys, again, regarding the airlines, and I think this was spelled out in that piece of the uh, bill. Do you know, and this makes sense that it's coming from Greg, do you know if those who support the airlines, i.e. caterers and ground support, and I think ground support was in there, will those entities be supported in some fashion? Yes, and actually, Greg, this is good news for you. Let me find the language. Um, for the low, so there's two sides of this, right? There's that big package, right? That has all the constraints around it for, we call it big business, but, but I understand because I know you and I know what you do. In the, the, the loan piece of this, up to 10 million for, for uh, restaurants, the categories they put in here were restaurant, food service, caterers, and hotels. And that actually, as long as you're operating on the, under the accommodations and food service code, which I think is 72, you will be fine. 
I also believe that's that this is that one tier up to 10 million on the other, which is this big, you know, I'm, and I'm, I'm not going to use the word bailout. And, and I, it just, it's offensive to me that people think somehow, you know, airlines and restaurants are being bailed out. We're not being bailed out. We didn't do anything. We, we had a, a pandemic hit us and we were told we couldn't do business anymore. Let's just call it what it is. So the, the program that they're going to give this 500 billion is for about 29 billion has been earmarked for the airline and air cargo industries. And another 17 billion is intended for business involved in national security. So it does not spell it out in what I have. Um, but you know, if you can't sleep great, it's 1400 pages, you could read two, two and find it tonight. But in the meantime, on the first half for your business personally, you are covered in the restaurant hotel carve out. We specifically have caterers listed. So you should be in good shape. Are better shape than you sit today. I mean, our caterers for airlines, I mean, you think you're in pain. Yeah. That's a double whammy. So hang in there, Greg. We need your business back and, uh, and, and moving quickly. Yep, true. Um, okay, so when you, no, I'm good. Um, one question too, that this has come up a, a few times as well, is what if they haven't been open, open for a full calendar year? Um, so they opened in January. They would qualify since they were open on February. As long as they were operating before February 15th. But then how do they establish the benchmark? Well, the benchmark for, for the paid sick leave, good question. I don't know, but all I know today is you would qualify because if you were operating before February 15th, meaning that you were, you had utilities running, you had employees in your jobs, I'm guessing they'd probably take a number of week look back, Anna, like they'd yeah. look back from, let's say the loan came in April 14th, they'd look back to January and get an average of that payroll, I'm assuming. But the, the big thing is, as long as you were open and you were doing business and things were working for you on the 15th of February, you will be eligible for this program. Great, great. All right, let's see here. Okay, let's, the PPP, the, pay, the payroll part. Um, does the PPP not require us to maintain payroll at the same level prior to the virus? Okay, ask me that again, sorry. Yeah. That's just like the, the end of the day. The payroll protection program. Yep, yep. Does, does it require them to maintain payroll at the same level prior to the virus? It does not. It does not. And, and let me think about how I can answer this for you. Um, so the borrower is eligible for loan forgiveness equal to the amount spent by the borrower during an eight-week period after the original origination date of the loan on payroll cost, interest, and payment. It says, um, uh, hang on. They're going to look back at the same period last year. And if you have employees that you have, have been laid off that you want to bring back now, right? Because you're now you're going to start to operationalize. That will not penalize you from having a reduced payroll at the beginning of the period. So it sounds like you'll be okay, even though you already laid your employees off, you, you still will be okay when they do the look back. That, that's, that's what I think, but Anna, mark that one down and we'll just ask okay. um, probably Matt first thing in the morning. Yeah, that sounds But good. the whole idea is not to penalize you, right? It, the whole idea is for you to actually bring people back and get people working. And so uh, my instinct would be, no, you should be absolutely fine. And then there's a, a secondary question to this, and I, I haven't heard this before, but isn't there, isn't there room for abuse if payroll is no longer an expense and businesses hire family members? Because there must be some of the requirements in place to prevent that. Um, well, I know you have to submit all your records um, as part of the process. So the, the czar that's been put in charge of this, and I think that is actually a czar, which is interesting, um, that has been appointed from the treasury to actually do the oversight of the program. What we haven't talked about yet is the reporting. Mm -hmm. And so I don't wanna get into that yet, only because I don't know what the reporting requirements will be, um, but you can be assured that for any loan where you're going to have an amount forgiven, you're going to have to have some pretty good reporting that will have to go back. And so it won't just be, here's my amount. And then after my eight weeks run, this is what I'm not going to pay back in an email, right? There will be some type of reporting. We're just not at the implementation phase yet. Um, but it's a good one for us to mark down to make sure we have it as part of our ready to go kit when this thing hits. Yeah. Okay. So then 
this is this is one from Alexander, and Alexander's been really active during the chat, by the way. So thank you for for being Yay, here tonight. Thank you. Um, he's asking, so you can get the care loan, the care SBA loan of two hundred fifty percent of monthly average payroll, and not hire all persons back, and spend the proceeds on rent and other expenses. Yes. Yeah, so you would. Yep. You could. What they'll do is they'll, you will be able to. You, there's parts of this, the, the money that you will get in a loan, right up to 10 million or two and a half times your payroll, exactly what, what he said. Um, you can use a portion of it for those pieces and not have to repay, right? So depending on what you spend on and track, whether it's labor of full-time employee, you know, employees, it's rent, mortgage, mortgage interest, or utilities, those elements you will not actually have to pay back. So it's not that you're gonna get a bucket of money and you use a part here and the rest spreads out somewhere else. Once you take the part out that will be forgiven, everything else that you borrowed, you will have to begin paying back and you will have up to 10 years and a maximum of 4% interest to pay back the remainder of the unforgiven loan. Okay. Um, I wanted to revisit the rent issue again. We had a comment from Jonathan Horowitz. Hi, Jonathan. Hi, Jonathan. He said, a thought on the rent issue, and it's not a bad thought, so that's why I'm going to read it. He says that tenants can ask for a couple months of rent abatement now, for the landlord tax these couple months onto the back end of the lease, thus extending it on the back end, which might be an option. Yeah, and I think that's why I think it's a conversation. I think the conversation, Jonathan, you're spot on, right? It's, it's hardship. Um, we know that on the consumer side, those that are struggling to pay their mortgages, um, most of the lenders have given people 90 days and exactly that tacked it on to the end. Um, and so it's really, you know, to me, it's a game of how quick will the money come in, right? So if you've got amount of money now to pay for rent and uh, you probably don't want to tack it on later when you don't actually have the, those funds, right? Or you need, you need to stay in business today. It would make sense, right? So Jonathan's point is there's a lots of way to cut this. And, and I can tell you the one thing I know about our industry is there's nothing alike. And so some of you are single entity coffee shops, right? With bakeries. And some of you are all the way up to the Chris Pappas's of the world, right? With massive comprehensive organizations. So it's really going to be getting, when this is all said and done, the association will continue to give you as much of the information as possible. But what you're going to have to do is use the information and we will post it because I also realize it's eight o'clock. And for many of you, this is like way too much, um, especially with nothing in front of you. And so we will make sure that we put this up for you and post it now. Um, we'll have to do a little work in it because I got so many notes on this stuff and mix some different documents, right, to make sure we had the most. But we'll get this up. But your job will be to take the information, see what may apply to you, and then go ask an expert. Or like Anna said, if you're a member of ours, you have access to the Law Center, you can have a quick conversation um, and get clarity. Um, and so I just wanna make sure that's really clear because I would not want someone to do something that they think is right because their neighbor's doing it, but it doesn't actually, you know, this is, this is a time when we're, we're getting a relief package that most of you will qualify for with a percentage of unforgiven loan opportunity. And I wanna make sure you all take advantage of it and you benefit from it because the faster we can get you open and running or even just you know reopened at some kind of capacity and your employees back, that's good for everyone. So you know, I think that's why these, these two, this, this is good stuff. It's not perfect, but it's good stuff. Yeah. Um, one question from Jurgen, how quickly can we expect the SBA to release those loans? And I know we know for idle what they're releasing, but not sure about CARES yet, right? We were told um, very quickly, and I can't do a great impersonation of the president, uh, clearly, um, but very quickly. And so what we need to do is, that's terrible. It's so bad. It's just, it's late. Um, um, but I think um, we were told very quickly. I, I will tell you as an aside and another sort of project, there's a number of us working on, I'm slightly concerned about SBA's ability to process the volume that I think is going to come in, right? And so just looking at the amount of money, but looking at the businesses in need and the parameters with the restaurant, hotel, caterer carve out, um, we, we are presenting an idea tomorrow federally that we would use the insurance companies essentially would be the model to be the processors, right? So treasury can push the money out, the banks can take it, give it to you, but is SBA really set up to be able to process the number of claims that are going to come in when the goal right now is to get money in your hands as quick as possible. Um, I don't, with all due respect, the SBA is amazing and I thank God for them right now for our industry, but 
but right now is not when the site can go down and there's not enough people to process and you guys are waiting weeks for your money. So we are investigating hard to make sure that mechanism will work. Um, and I think that, that what we've laid out today and we're asking a number of associations to join the TRA in this effort with a number of other entities um, to say, why don't we use no different guys than re, you know restaurants now becoming retail to help the cause there's no better, no better organization and mechanism and infrastructure than our insurance companies to process things like this. And so that's also going on because whoever asked that question, I would say that's what concerns me is how quick can we get this money out because you needed it yesterday and the day before. Um, and so we will report back on the progress, but today we don't know other than very quickly, which doesn't really have a measurement or a date on it. No, it doesn't. Just hope that tomorrow, this is what you have to hope for going to bed, that the House just does the um, uh, vote orally and the president can sign by the end of the day because then we can move into the reading and, and the rulemaking and kind of how this stuff gets done and all the nuts and bolts that you all are desperate for. Um, I just don't want this to drag into Saturday and Sunday. So, so that's the, um, um, and thank you, Dusty. You're, you're a great partner. Um, and so that's, that's where we're at. So we're, we're, uh, we're moving along. Uh, thank you everyone. And I guess we can wrap it up. Yep. So, um, yeah, whatever you all need, we're here. We're learning as fast as you are. Um, just know that we're at the table, if not the head of the table and a lot of this stuff right now. And, um, you know, we, as a team are just not going to give up until we, we get this stuff in and you all are back in business or at least open to where you should be. So, you know, keep fighting. And, um, in the meantime, you know, E night at txrestaurant.org. Uh, you can you can write me. Um, Anna and I and, and many of our leadership team are pretty much 24/7 in some capacity. So thank you all. Thanks for listening. I'll get this packaged up. Hopefully tonight. I do have to go see my parents and get them some groceries um, since they can't leave their house. But if not, first thing in the morning we'll post this and um, be good to go. Perfect. All right, y'all have a good night. Great. Thank you guys.